We've been going through the book of Acts and journeying through the missionary work of the Apostle Paul, and it's been a wonderful experience to be able to take one of the books of the Bible and just go chapter by chapter through it. And today we find ourselves in Acts chapter 18, and our foundation, as I said earlier, is going to be verse 1 through 11. And we're going to look at the founding of the Corinthian church there at Corinth. And in fact, we know that Paul has a passion for the ministry there. We're going to learn that he spends a year and a half preaching the gospel and establishing the church there at Corinth, which is much longer than he normally stays in an area to start a church. We found out in Acts chapter 17 that Paul went to a place called Athens. And there in Athens, he is amazed by the culture shock. He goes into the city and he sees all of these statues. He sees these altars to the different gods like Zeus and and other gods that these people were worshiping. And then he gets to a place there in Athens that says, this is an altar to the unknown God. And so to the God that we did not know His name. And Paul uses that as an opportunity and says, you don't know His name, you might not realize who this God is, but I'm going to tell you who the God that I serve is. And God preaches Uh, through the message comes through Paul and he tells them who this God is. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the God who loves these individuals regardless of how sinful they've been. He loves them enough that he gave his son Jesus to pay the price of their sins. And so he preaches the gospel. He leaves Athens and now you're going to find that as he leaves Athens he goes to his next location and that's where we pick up in Acts chapter 18. After this, the Apostle Paul, he left Athens and he went to Corinth where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them and began the same occupation, uh, being of that, stayed with them and worked for there were tent makers by trade. So you find out that Paul leaves Athens. He comes to Corinth. He meets two fellow believers in Jesus Christ, Priscilla and Aquila. And he is now going to join them in working uh, to gain resources so that he can continue this missionary journey as being tent makers. Tent makers at that time would have used the skin of goats to make their tents. And so Paul is going to be using his hands. This is not unusual because many, if not all, the rabbis of that time had a vocation besides just the preaching and teaching of the Word. They actually did something. You remember Jesus? What was Jesus known for as not only being the rabbi, he was also the, also the son of the carpenter. And so he worked with his hands. He would have been in the carpenter shop. And here Paul was a tent maker. You have followers of Jesus that were fishermen. And now you see what's happening here. It says that while he is there, it says that he reasoned, which means he preached, he taught in the synagogue every Sabbath. This was not unusual. Paul goes to the Jews first. He goes to the synagogue. Every time he goes to a new location, he goes to where the religious hub is so that he can share the good news of the salvation that comes only through Jesus. He says, and he tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. Now, the reason that word tried is because Paul is only required to present the good news. He is trying to share this with them. He cannot force them. We cannot force anyone to become believers in Jesus Christ, but we can at least try. And I asked you this question, and you can answer privately to yourself. Have you at least tried this week to persuade someone about Jesus? Answer that to yourself. In verse 5, it says, When Silas and Timothy, and if you remember Silas and Timothy, Timothy was a young believer. Paul had led him to the Lord. Silas had been thrown in prison with Paul, preaching the gospel. He's a fellow traveler, missionary. It says that when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with preaching the message. And Solomon testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. I love part of that uh, fact, all of it, but part of it really stands out to me. It says that while his two missionary friends came, 
Paul was occupied doing what? Preaching and teaching about Jesus. He was occupied about Jesus. What is on your daily calendar? Is a lot of it just a bunch of nothing? Or is it what is important, the kingdom? We waste a lot of time, don't we? We waste a lot of time. And I will tell you something. Whenever you spend time doing the work of God, that is time well spent. It says here in verse 6, But when they resisted and blessing, He shook His robe and told them, Your blood is on your heads. I am innocent. Paul, remember where he's at? He's in the synagogue. Those that heard the message when they would not take it, the reason why he goes through such a dramatic act of shaking his robe, he says to them, I don't even want the very dust or dirt that was in this synagogue to be on me because when I leave this place, I don't want anything about what you are doing to be on me because I am going to start afresh. I'm leaving this place and his ministry now is going to shift where before it was take the message first to the Jews. Now the message is going to shift and he tells us this. So he left there and went to a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. And Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with the whole household. Many of the Corinthians when they heard, believed, and were baptized. If you read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, you find out that Paul only baptized two individuals that are listed uh, in the text. And Christmas was actually one of the two people Paul personally baptized himself. Here it says that while he does this, he leaves. People are being believers. They're baptized because that's what normally comes after you believe in Jesus Christ. It's the, this, the act of going and making it public. And then verse 9 it says, Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking. And don't be silent. For God to say to Paul, don't be afraid. Let's just use some logic here. If you tell someone, don't be afraid, obviously it's because there must be some fear present. Paul is a bold believer in speaking the truth for Christ, but did not mean he still wasn't human. Folks, you can still have fear in sharing the gospel because you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And Paul had a right to have some type of fear. He had been thrown in prison. He had been stoned. He had been beaten with rods. Paul had been run out of town. So yes, fear can be natural. But we live not by the natural. We live by the supernatural grace of God. And here we see that he says to Paul in this vision, don't be afraid. And how do you conquer fear, Paul? And how do you conquer fear, church? It says keep on speaking and don't be silent. You see, because the enemy wants you to live in fear and living in fear by being quiet and not sharing the hope that comes in God. You see, the world is in fear of what will happen. But we as a church know that God is in control. You flip through the channels and you see all the uh, wild things that are happening overseas. You find out in yourself, you're wondering what China will do, what Russia will do, what will happen to Ukraine, what will happen in Poland and Hungary and Romania and all of these places. We don't know based on the actions of certain people in this world what will happen. But what we do know is this, regardless of what happens, God Almighty has not surrendered His control. And here it says that He is told to keep on speaking don't remain silent, verse 10, for I am with you and because I have many people in this city. And he stayed there about a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now pause there for a moment. Now what I want to give you today is I'm going to break down, as I have already, some of the texts. I'm going to give you one main verse that I'd like for you if you underline your Bible text. I'm going to give you an underlined verse that I feel like will speak to you for the entire week and longer, hopefully. But then what I want to do is I just want to just really bring it home to how you can apply this to your life, not only now, but in the future. So let me just give it to you. 
Corinth is not one of these cities that is considered to be uh, the cultural hub of education. Remember, Athens was the Harvard, the Yale, the Oxford. They were the place of the intellect. And Paul was kind of shocked that they were worshiping so many gods because they had so much knowledge, they thought, that they were actually just completely foolish in their beliefs. Uh, just because someone has all the college degrees in the world does not mean that they are close with God. You can be an old peasant farmer, tenant farmer out in the field and be closer to God than some kind of professor teaching a religious course. You, you can based on your relationship with God. It's not your educational level. So when he gets to Corinth, it's, it's, he finds something different. Corinth, on every corner, and I'm going to keep this as G-rated as possible, on every corner was a woman that wanted them, Paul and others to spend their money with them in very uh, sinful ways. How's that? Is that keeping it G-rated? Uh, they wanted, that's what was this. Every corner there was something like that. On every corner there was some kind of uh, sinful uh, nature or sinful act that was available. Corinth is over twice the size of Athens. And that's why some say, well, one, there was so much sin in Corinth. That's why Paul spent a year and a half there because basing the church, teaching them, he spent so much time there. But also because the city is so large, it's just a greater work for Paul and the missionaries to do. Corinth was nothing more than a modern day, if you think about cities such as Los Angeles or New York, it was just nothing more than a modern day uh, Sodom and Gomorrah type atmosphere. Everything went, everything goes. You even had in the church where uh, people were uh, having relationships with their stepmother. I mean, if you read First and Second Corinthians, it would blow you away what's happening in Corinth. It makes what looks that happens in uh, Atkinson uh, very tame. I'll just say that, okay? Uh, May Atkinson would be definitely a Mayberry compared to Corinth. But what I'm getting at is that Paul goes in there, he sees all this and he all the temptations of what's happening, and he still preaches the gospel. He's still bold in his faith. And the early believers, how many of you know that you can't take but so much? You've got sin pounding you on all sides, temptation pounding you on all sides, that you just got to surrender to God and say, God, I need you just to protect my mind, my eyes, my mouth. Protect me because there's so much out there that is just being flaunted in front of me. And that's what Paul was going through. But in this, Paul was still encouraged. What Here's the main part of the message, this. Verse 11. We find out that when he's told to stay there, and then he says he stays there a year and a half, but what is allowed him to stay there is what happens in the verse before that, verse 10. Let me give it to you, and then we'll just break it down. God speaks to Paul, the Lord himself. The Lord speaks to Paul in this vision, this, this night vision, and says to him, Paul, I am with you. Paul, I am with you. Folks, I encourage you at times to mark your Bible. You've known that. But this is definitely one you mark, you can circle, and take it to the bank. Does God change? God doesn't change. Is there times that you have felt alone in doing what God has called you to do? God's called you to be faithful in the work. God's called you to be dedicated, dependable on Him. And there's at times that we just feel like we're in it by ourselves. Paul must have felt that way because God reminds him, Hey, there are other people here in Corinth that are also believers. You're going to be okay, Paul. But not only if there was no one else in Corinth, not if not one other person believed in the gospel, God speaks to him. And the Lord himself says to Paul, I am with you. Now, in the last so many weeks of looking at this text, here's what it speaks to me. If God does not change, and God encourages us through his word, and we want God to speak to us, we have a world right now that needs to know, the body of Christ needs to understand that God is still with us. If we look in Matthew's gospel, the very last chapter of Matthew 28 verse 20, Jesus says, 
as he gets ready to leave this world. He says, I am with you always, even unto the very end of this age. When we take, and I know this is a very serious note, and I want it to be this way. When we take our very last breath on this side of eternity, understand Jesus, His Spirit, His presence is with us when we take our last breath and He's with us when we take the next breath there in heaven. He has not left us. He has not abandoned us. Many of our elderly people who are on the bed of suffering and pain and sickness and death, they get depressed because oftentimes family abandons them. Oftentimes friends forget them. But we know this, that there's so many elderly Christian people that have looked at their Bible and says, I remember the preacher saying, God does not change. And if he would not abandon Paul in a place that was nothing more than corrupt and sinful like Corinth, he will not abandon me in my cancer or my sickness or my problems or my pain. He does not just not only abandon the elderly when they are there the last stage of life, he will not abandon you whenever you come up from the baptism waters. Because once we are saved, the enemy wants to attack us. The enemy cannot take your salvation, but the enemy can get you to doubt your salvation. And I will tell you this, you can doubt your salvation, but you, if you do, it is to your own despair because just as you look in the mirror and no one can convince you, you are someone different than what you really are. You look in the mirror and say, I know I am who I am. Here I am. Well, my friends, you can look in the mirror and say, I am a child of God regardless of what the enemy says. As children, have we been disobedient to God? I'm sure all of us have. But just like a good and loving father, we might be punished as we deserve. But we also know this, that our Father loves us enough that He never expels us from His love. He never expels us from His love. Let me show you a few Bible verses. Can I just go to the Bible and prove what I'm saying to you? Thank you for your permission. Uh, and I encourage you to turn. And if you don't turn, then I encourage you at least write this down. And the reason why I want you to write it down is I'm going to give you some Bible verses this morning that between now and the time we leave this place, that if this doesn't encourage you, I don't know what will. Because the main focus today is this, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of where you're at, you can be in a sinful state of the job you work at. God's not left you. Your, your co-workers can be doing stuff that's just horrendous. God still loves you and has not left you. You might be in sickness. God's not going to leave you. He still loves you. God loves you enough that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we look at the book of Genesis. At the very beginning, it says in Genesis chapter 28. Take a few moments, if you will, and turn over to Genesis 28. If you're new in, le in finding books of the Bible, the easy way is if you've got the revelation, you've gone too far. So just go to the very beginning of your Bible. Genesis 28, verse 15. Now, did we say that God doesn't change? And that His Word is true yesterday, today, and His Word will be true tomorrow? Yes. So let's look at His Word. Genesis 28, 15. Listen to what God says to us. The Word of God speaks the following. Look, behold, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. God will not leave us. God is with us while we travel. God is with us wherever we go. Why? Because it says, I am with you and not only with you, but I'm going to watch over you. If you ever had a babysitter as a child, you know there were some babysitters that you probably would desire more than others because some would be there and they were with you, but some would actually watch over you. And some of you as parents know there's some people in the community that you could call to watch your child. And you say, well, they would be with them. But how many of you know sometimes that's not enough to have someone to just to be there? But aren't you glad we have a God that's not only just saying, I'm there, 
but I'm going to watch over you as well. He's watched over me more than I can ever imagine. And He's watched over you even whenever you didn't realize it. He says, I will watch over you and not only watch over you while you are in church. Not only while you, and I thank God He doesn't take roster. He doesn't take attendance. He doesn't watch over us just when we're being good boys and good girls. He watches over us wherever we go. My friends, I will tell you this. When you pray over your child, they might end up in the nightclub that night. They might end up in the back seat of someone's car. But God is still watching over them. God knows and God can convict them anywhere they are. There's no location that will surprise God because He always is watching over us. Now let's turn over to some more part of the Bible because maybe you say, well, that's good for one text. And you showed us in Matthew's Gospel. You showed us in the book of Acts. But Pastor Ken, is there anywhere else other than there in Genesis? Well, let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. The Bible says the following, God is speaking to His people. Do not fear. For I am with you. Is this the same words we read in the book of Acts that Paul heard? Yes. It says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid. Why? Because I am your God and I will strengthen you and I will help you and I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. You see... If you will surrender your life to Christ and you will put Him as Lord of your life, the King of your kingdom, if you will confess Jesus as Savior, if you will turn over your sins and realize that He is the only one that can redeem you, when you are born again, not by works or deeds, but by simply a transformation of asking Him to come into your life, and you say, but I've waited near the end. It does not matter because in God's kingdom, there is no end. You might have waited to the end of this life, but there is no end of all eternity. So no, you did not wait too late. You didn't wait. If a man on a cross could be dying and turn to Jesus and say, please remember me. You say, well, he waited too late. No, because Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. You have not waited too late. If you hear this message right now, or maybe later on you hear this message again, you have not waited too late. Why? Because if you will turn to the Lord, He will not abandon you because you are His child. It tells us don't fear. Doctor reports can get us fearful, can it not? We all know what fear is. But fear, my friends, is not final. You do not have to fear. Now, are we realistic? Yes. But you don't have to fear. Why? Because He is with us. And then it tells us, it says that He will not only be with us because He's our God, but I love this part in Isaiah. It says, He's going to strengthen you. Maybe you've been weak. Maybe you have a parent that's sick and they're weak. I saw yesterday, I was with my grandmother, and my grandma's 92 years old, and I thank the Lord I still have my grandmother with me. And while we were together, I could just tell uh, she's not as strong as she used to be. When you get 92, you have a right to, to get a little weaker, right? But I can tell you this on the inside, she's strong because of her faith still in Jesus Christ and the hope of heaven. You see, your body might fall apart on this side of the world. Your body might go through... All kinds of sickness and ailments. And you might have to get radiation and treatments and chemo. And you might have to do all of these things that makes you weak. Friends, we have people in our own church right now that is battling ailments and sicknesses that we don't even realize that when they come to church on Sunday that they're hurting more than they actually let on. We have people right now that are in hospitals and at the Mayo Clinic that much rather be here than they had there. But the Scripture is not that God is with us when we are physically strong and able to plow the field and plant the gospel message. He is with us when we are weak. His strength is strong enough. When I am the, at my weakest, when I am at my most defeated, when I am at my point of I realize I have nothing to offer the Lord, 
that is exactly when the Lord's strength shows up most in my life and in yours as well. He does not love you because you have anything to offer Him. He loves you because He has everything to offer you. It says, I will hold on to you because I, my strength is enough. I will help you. Do you need a helper? It says, I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. Folks, if you are in here and you have a child, especially you mamas, and I've seen some of you mamas with your children, if you have a young child and they want to get ready to run out to the road, mamas are holding that hand. Trust me, mamas ain't going to just let the child run out to danger, are they? No. And God is the same way. God says, I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. When you want to run into danger, when you want to go into sin, I'm not going to let you go. I am holding on to you. Now let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 43, just a few chapters over, verse 5. Here we find these words that are so familiar. And you say, well, Pastor Ken, they almost sound identical. Well, the reason why is because God doesn't change. In Isaiah 43, 5, it says, Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. You see, we do not have to fear because God says, I am there and I will gather you together. And my friends, He's going to gather us not to Israel one day. He will gather us to His eternal kingdom in heaven. Let's continue. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 8. Go over just a little bit further uh, to the next part. This is Jeremiah 1, 8. Do not be afraid of anyone. For I will be with you to deliver you. This is the Lord's declaration. So do we believe what God says? That we do not have to be afraid because He will deliver us from our enemies? Yes. And then you go over to Haggai chapter 1 verse 13 in the Old Testament. Very small book of the prophet. It says here, Haggai the Lord's messenger delivered the Lord's message to the people. I am with you. This is the Lord's declaration. Now let's turn back to the book of Acts before we leave this place. In Acts 18, what do we say? We saw that Paul is told in this night vision. I think it's important that the reason why we're told that what time that God speaks to him these promises is at night. When you think about night, you think about not seeing a lot of people around you. You think about night, you think about in the New Testament, Gospels, anytime night's mentioned, and mostly time there's something dealing with sin. The absence of light. But let me just say this to speak to you just as boldly and simple as I can. God promises Paul in his darkest hours, I am with you. And Paul, when he hears this from the Lord, Paul has to remember, Lord, I know you are. You were with me when they threw me in jail those two times before I came to Corinth. You were with me when they thought I was dead and, and all the brothers in the church surrounded me after I was stoned. You remember he was stoned and all the people got around him and then Paul stood up and said, okay, y'all ready to go on another trip? I, I mean, you, you were with me when they stripped me naked and beat me with rods. You see, God wants His people to know this. When things are at its worst... God does not leave us. Let me ask, ask you this. In the humanity we live in now, when people are, are at their worst, isn't it easy to simply back off and abandon them and leave? When you find out there's a family member that is strung out on drugs, it's easy to back off. And so you know what? That's their problem, not mine. When you find out there's a family member that's addicted to alcohol, well, that's their problem, not mine. When you find out somebody's been caught up in adultery, that's their problem, not mine. When you find out somebody has done X, Y, and Z, you yeah, come on now. And when we think about that, that is totally opposite of what God does. God sees us in our darkest moments. He sees you when you're battling cancer. He sees you when you're taking care of an elderly parent. He sees you whenever you're financially at your lowest. He sees you whenever you have mental health problems. Let me tell you something. Mental health is truly an epidemic right now where people are suffering from all kinds of things that is in their mind. 
But you know what? Regardless of how bad it gets, you know the good news is? God is with us. People leave. Have you ever heard of a marriage splitting up? You know why it splits up? Because people go their own ways. God never abandons His bride. He stays there. The moment you're saved, you become part of the bride of Christ. And He loves you so much, He will stay there. And then at nighttime, it says, at night He gets this message from the Lord. And He tells him, keep on preaching. Don't be silent. In verse 10, for I am with you. And then when it says this, listen, we're about to close up. It says, because I have many people... And well, first it says, and no one will lay a hand on you. Well, you say, well, hold on now. Are you saying that from now on out, Paul's going to be protected? While he's in Corinth, he says, I, no one's going to touch you while you're here. Maybe that's another reason he stays there a year and a half. Paul's enjoying not getting beat up, you know, every time he turns around. But he says, he says I, no one's going to get you while you're here. Preach the gospel to these sinful people. You're going to be okay. And why? It says, because I have many people in this city. You know, he could have said, Paul, you're going to be okay because the next time somebody comes up against you, I'm just going to poof, strike them dead. He doesn't do that. He says, Paul, there's going to be a lot of people that are going to support you while you're doing what you're doing. Folks, look around this room. Think about all the people who have ever been in your life that are believers in Christ. Should we not be supporting and loving one another that when one is hurting that we share in that hurt so that hurt's divided? When you see someone happy, should we not share in that happiness so the joy is multiplied? I'm almost done. It says, And he stayed there a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them. Charles Spurge, and I close with this. You probably have heard the name often. Charles Spurgeon said in this one text that I just shared with you, Paul is there around the year 50 A.D. is the time period. In that one text, Spurgeon says the following, God is presenting Himself through that one text by telling him, I am with you the following. He is telling him that Paul can trust in the presence of Jesus. I'm with you. He's the presence of the Lord, regardless of where you go. You can come to the altar, He'll be with you. Young people, you find yourself in the nightclub with somebody you don't supposed to be with, God is still with you. The Holy Spirit will convict you to get out of there. I read a wonderful article, and if you want to see it, I'll send it to you. A young lady who was accepted full ride scholarship to Chapel Hill to play on the women's basketball team. She got there and she said when they went through some changes of coaches that the first year was fine, but the second year she felt like if she didn't participate in certain activities on the college level that she was the outcast. And so she chose. She said, I, just, I gave up my full scholarship to Chapel Hill to go somewhere else because I did not feel that it was right for me to compromise who I am. Well, that was the Holy Spirit convicting her because why, regardless if she was on the campus of Chapel Hill or the campus of Campbell University, God Almighty Spirit is present with us. Secondly, Spurgeon says the following, that in this text it shows the compassion of Jesus. Jesus lets them know that do not be afraid. I am with you. Jesus has compassion on us. Don't think that for one minute it doesn't bother the Lord to see His children hurt. He has compassion. And finally, Charles Spurgeon says, in this text, it shows the cooperation of Jesus. When he says, I will be with you to keep preaching, do not remain silent. Cooperation means that Jesus is going to be doing the work through him. You can trust that today. I'm going to ask Ms. Diane to come forward. This morning, as we close out this message, the invitation is this. Please listen, because this is actually the most important 60 seconds of the message. The invitation is this. Are you hurting today? And I don't mean physically, because sometimes you can take Tylenol, ibuprofen, and all the other kind of pills there are to, to numb the pain. But how many of you know there's some medicine that will not help the pain that's on the inside? Have you ever hurt that way? Well, I know I have. 
Anyone in here else hurt that way when you see a family member hurting, when you see a child hurting, you see yourself hurting? There's something on the inside that's hurting. Guess what? God says, I will not leave you while you're hurting. Today, maybe you've been diagnosed with a disease. But you know what? The worst disease that anyone was ever diagnosed with it was sin. And when Jesus paid the price and forgave us our sins, He offered healing. And the healing, my friends, is our salvation. You see, my friends, today is that whenever we are saved, we are healed on the inside. Something that x-ray does not show. Something that MRI will not show. But what it will show is the life that's in you has been born again. And when you stand before God, even though no medical report can say there was healing performed, Jesus looks at you and says, I have given you a new life here. Enter into the kingdom of God. You have that new body. Maybe you've lived your life in rebellion against God for so many years. You didn't need church. You didn't need fellowship. You didn't need any of those things. And now you realize, wait a minute. I didn't wait too long. I'm still breathing. I'm still breathing. And today, if you still have breath in your body, Jesus loves you enough to say this. I've allowed you to live this long so that why? So that I can be with you to the finish line. I don't care how you started this race in life. You might have been the worst person in the neighborhood, but you know what? God loves you enough to say, I will finish the race with you. He will finish it with us. And whenever we finish the race with the Lord, do you remember what He says? Well done, good and faithful servant. Today, the altar is open. You can come pray for yourself. You can pray for a loved one. But will you take the scriptures that I gave you this morning? Genesis 28, 15, Joshua 3, 7, Isaiah 41, 10, Isaiah 43, 5, Jeremiah 1, 8, Haggai 1, 13, Matthew 28, 20. Will you take all of these texts and say, wait a minute, what is the common theme of this? What was the common theme? I am the Lord your God. I will not leave you.